Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest Blood Red podcast from the Liverpool Echo. I'm Joe Rimmer, your host, joined today by the bronze bombshell himself, <laughs> Paul Gorst. I don't know whether I'm speaking to you or that, that Mike. For your um, few minutes on the beds this weekend? Well, apparently so, according to one particular emailer, but um, that was all smooth. Can you just tell us smooth, smooth quickly what, what he said to you? Um, <laughs> the, the, yeah, the beds have been it's quite doing. funny. I mean, I get to stick on Twitter, but I don't really get it to me email, but yeah. this one was a particularly angry email on Monday morning. Um, and said all that's all, all that's all that's some bad action must have rotted your brain or something. Um, <laughs> no idea what he was referring to, in all honesty. But uh, yeah, smoothed over. I, I replied, and um, we're friends again. We're friends again, yeah. I might do a few minutes together on the beds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Six minutes holiday will do us. Paul Doc Ghost at ReachPLC dot com. If you'd like to um, comment on his tan, Theo Squires, how are you? Uh, deflated, deflated, frustrated. Yeah, yeah it's one of those weekends, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 rare that we do a podcast these days after yeah. after a defeat. You know, it's um we've got we're quite privileged in that we we often unpick wins or every now and again a draw, which which end can be frustrating. World. Yeah, which often feels like the end of the world. But I'm determined for our our glasses. I've said this a few times on this pod recently, but our glasses of Carabao oh, to be yeah. half full. Um, this, this... Yeah, who sponsors the FA Cup now? Is it still Budweiser? Emirates, isn't it? Oh, do you oh, mean Emirates. in terms of drinks? Emirates, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, you, you can't, you can't. <laughs> it's not the Carabao, is it? Yeah, exactly. So, the Carabao, the Carabao's where it's at. Like Theo said before we started on the pod, you wouldn't find Coventry City in the the semi finals of the Carabao Cup, would you? So, nah. it's no. pure class, the Carabao. So, um, yeah, we're live on YouTube. Can you clarify Facebook? that that was an in joke to our Coventry City friends? Yeah, we're not slagging Coventry. Yeah. In general. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are live on YouTube um, and Facebook. So, um, if you've got any questions or you'd like a shout out or you want to know where Gorsty or... goes to get his tan topped yeah, up. Yeah, you want to know where Gorsty goes to get his tan topped up. Or, or you just want to vent, um, jump in the comments and and, um, and let off some steam because, um, yeah, it was a frustrating one yesterday. And yeah, if you're also watching on YouTube, give us a like, subscribe, press the bell, um, which is a perfectly normal thing to ask. And um, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, give us, a, give us a star rating. You don't have to give us all five, but... That would be nice, and um, say something nice in the comments. It always, you know, it's always nice when someone we says need, nice. We things. need the positivity, don't we? Yeah, no, I, I've got what you do. Especially. I do, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've got this thing I always say to my wife that, that people are, people always complain, but they don't say enough nice things. That's true, yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's determined for more nice things to be said in this podcast. Saying that, we are going to unpick, unpick a defeat. So um, yeah, I mean, that, if just where do you start with that game yesterday? It, it just it was chaos, wasn't it, all round? And Liverpool, really, I mean, I know we've we've read and seen this, you know, said by people inside and outside of Liverpool since then, but only themselves to blame, really. Yeah, it didn't start well, which is a bit of a theme, which is weird, really, considering how good Liverpool's season has been. But the first halves are always really sluggish and they struggle to get going and struggle to get momentum and, and rhythm and, and get up to, to top speed. And United deservedly took the lead. But Liverpool found the way into the game, didn't they? And, and by the end of it, they, would, they finished the first half very strongly with the two goals and, and obviously the one they had disallowed. But um, I, I knew I knew the second half would be much different and it would be a lot better. And so it proved to be, but there was just a lack of a, a ruthless streak about yeah. them, a lack, a lack of a cutting edge. And it almost just seemed like the chances were just coming and coming so frequently that it felt like, oh, they'll they get the third at some point, it's fine. You know, another chance goes begging, don't worry about it, there'll be another one soon enough. And... It just felt like that maybe seeped onto the pitch itself at times and um and Arna made a couple of decent saves that you'd expect them to, a few last ditch yeah. tackles and blocks and interceptions and Liverpool choosing the wrong option and um at one point it was just attack for defence. It, it just kept coming. Mm -hmm. The ball just kept staying in the United's half. And the longer that goes on, I think I wrote it in the match blog at the time, the longer that goes on, you start to suspect that United will sneak a leveler and, and he did with, with Anthony who I read this morning, it was his first goal against the soft flight club for 336 days, <laughs> which is incredible, really. He's got twice this season. 85 million winger, but he picked his moment for to, to end that drought. And he did change the game when he came on. Yeah, he, he was good, wasn't yeah. he? But uh, just felt maybe as, as the game wore on into extra time, Liverpool started to really feel the um, the impact of, of the players yeah. who were absent. You know, no Trent. You know, what Klopp would have given to have brought on a Canate or a Matip for Kwanzaa in the latter stages or... You know, Thiago in midfield or a Curtis. Jota might have nicked the winner. Alisson, no, you know, obviously not there either. And yeah, um, 
I think that ultimately is what has undone Liverpool after a great run. And like you said at the top of the show, we, you know, just a second defeat in, in 2024. So you can't be too critical or, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. But yeah, it was. It just felt like a, an opportunity missed in that second half, really. It, it massively did, Theo. And, and I mean, I, I think there's so many. Someone's in the comments here immediately saying, did United have a, a lot of first team players out or coming back from injury have they played in midweek how many under 21s have been playing for us tired players and, and it's hard to yeah, I, I, although I do agree Liverpool have the, only themselves to blame in the sense that they made the wrong decisions during the match and you know there was a, that obviously there was that five on two break that they had that they just squandered and um you could even go to the final corner and and think it was just a bit it was a bit rubbish to get caught out like the way they did for all that you can't ignore the the facts, which is that Liverpool have got so many players injured, and and I think they've done so well. I mean, the whole point in the League Cup final victory and how good that was was because they did it without so many first team players available. They overcame the odds. They've been overcoming the odds week after week, game after game for the past two three months. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, when did the injury crisis really start? Probably. I, I always pinpoint it as Allison and Jota against City yeah. in in November. Yeah. yeah. So so. They've been overcoming the odds now for two, three months. And, you know, you read some of the reaction online and obviously it's extreme, but you can go away to Old Trafford and lose. I know they aren't a very good football team, but that can happen. And is it really a huge surprise? No, I don't think it was. Like, Liverpool should have won that game. They had the chance to win that game. But at the same time, they didn't feel like they necessarily deserved to win that game. United had more clear-cut chances where you're thinking they should have scored that. Whereas Liverpool, they were in the final third, they were creating things, but it's not as though it was amazing defending stopping them or amazing save stopping them. It was like Nunes lashing it as hard as he can straight at Anana or just the wrong pass, like the 5-1-2, yeah. as you've mentioned. There. Like, it reminded me of the one against Arsenal. We think, yeah. how can they not yeah, take advantage yeah. of this? And they somehow didn't. It was like a poor pass, I think, from Gakpo that's bobbling up. Mm-hmm. Elliot's obviously going to want to try and get on his left foot. Yeah. And it just wasn't clicking in that final third. And that happened numerous times in that game. Like, you look at how United played for 30 five minutes when Harry Maguire was the only real defender on the pitch Bruno Fernandes at centre-back Anthony at left-back and Liverpool not really once in extra time looked like taking advantage yeah. of that Elliot hit the post with the when Anana went walkabouts but still it was something lacking it wasn't a cohesive effort from them and like Anana he's not the best goalkeeper in the world like he had a stinker for Liverpool's second goal when he flaps at the cross he had a couple of moments like that it's not like the pass. even the pass he put out yeah. when, when Liverpool scored that pass put his, his defender under so much pressure and for a guy who's been you know, the, one of the reasons they signed him is he can play the ball. You know, again, it makes me look at Allison and, and, and Kelleher and think, goodness me, Liverpool have got two good goalkeepers there, yeah. considering you look at him and I, I can't, I don't think he touches Keller. I don't, I honestly don't think We've he had a, a decade of, you go and play United, whether it's Anfield or Old Trafford, and when Liverpool have had a good day, they still haven't got the win because David De Gea is just putting in a man of match yeah. performance. Anana is not that level. You can put him under pressure and you should win the game. And Liverpool just didn't manage to do that. It, it was a game too far from all the injuries. Like the fact that Klopp's come out and said we had another three or four players that we wanted to take off. Like you can question the substitutions, but not really much else you can do when you look at the injuries. Considering the two, three months, if you've got to this stage and you're still only second in the league on goal difference, you're into the Europa quarterfinals, you've won a trophy... It's not the end of the world missing out on the FA Cup. It just stings that bit more because Wembley was in the site. You know what everyone's saying about the FA Cup? They're saying that the Carabao Cup is the is the new FA Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone's saying that, and yeah, I mean, uh, to be fair, if you you don't pick competitions and you you go for them all, but if you were to pick a game for Liverpool to lose, and again, you don't want to lose to your rivals, but <clears> if you could pick a competition for Liverpool to exit, it would probably be this one. It doesn't help that it's before an international break. Um, you know, it's not it's yeah. not great for morale, is it? But I think if Liverpool were playing, I said to you yesterday, if Liverpool were playing on Tuesday, as frustration as, yeah, that, yeah. as that was, yeah. I'd have thought, you know what, we go again Tuesday and, and, and it all will be okay. And if there was a league game at the weekend, you know, dropping points at the league right now is unthinkable, but losing in the mm. FA Cup... Is You'd rather lose this one than the one in three weeks' time. Yeah, but but the, the thing that really annoyed me is, and it sounds like sour grapes, and I'm sure United fans are, are enjoying a lot of Liverpool fans saying this at the moment, but they're not a very good team. There was that picture that went viral in the second half of the space between yeah. their defence yeah. and midfield. It, it, just, it just felt like Liverpool have played United twice this season, drew with them at Anfield, 
lost to them now in the FA Cup. And we've seen Liverpool play so well this season and they've not taken advantage of that against United and that and that is frustrating. Yeah, they, they'll have won games this season where they haven't played anywhere near as well as, yeah. as either of those two games. I know I know a few Liverpool fans who like tune into Manchester United podcasts whenever there's been like a particularly bad defeat. <laughs> so we, we might we might be getting the kind of the, the same end today, but um so this might sound like sour grapes to them, but like you say, if you had to choose which of the three competitions was going to fall by the wayside before the international break, you would have said the FA Cup, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, the Bill's still in with a chance of going top. And they play Brighton on Easter Sunday. And of course, the last eight of the Europa League with a winnable tie against um, Atalanta. So look, it's not a terminal, terminal defeat. Um, it stings and, and it will for Klopp and the players and, and the fans for most of the next fortnight. But... Yeah. Um, then you dust yourself down and you see if you've got any lads back from injury and you go again. Um, but it's just frustrating knowing that um, United feel like they've been let off the hook. Yeah, Certainly, yeah. that December draw, there was no doubt about it. But this one, you know, a chance to really turn the screw in that second half at Old Trafford to go three and maybe even four one up. And, and they, they missed it, passed them by. And United, as they tend to do, um, don't really play well, but cling in dig in and games, hang on and, and eventually, you know, g- get a result. Let's give them some credit. I think they've got character and I, and I think... Mm, a bit of resilience they, to, yeah, to them. Yeah. yeah. They've got more than, you know, like you see you see some teams fall apart and they, and they don't have anything about them, whereas United do still have players that are capable of, of turning games. And, and I, they remind me, I, I grew up probably, you probably may be thinking like Chelsea was maybe your main rivalry from when you were younger. No, you, you're selling me short there. Manchester United. 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 Yeah, I, I was young. Think. <laughs> I'm in my thirties. Yeah, I was thinking about United as like when I grew up, Liverpool weren't very good, and even when we had really poor seasons, if they came to Anfield, I thought we could turn them over. You know, like, bloody the nose. Yeah, and 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 there were times when they must have come away from Anfield thinking, how oh, the hell did we get beat by them? You know, they got as you before, they've got Igor Biscan in midfield, midfield, and they've they've beaten us here comfortably. So it does happen, doesn't it? And I think. United are like the inverse of that, where yeah, Liverpool are dominant and by far the better team, but they have their moments. And Gonacho, I think, is a good player, and he he caused them problems. And it was just a game decided by big moments. Well, this is the highlight of United's season. You look at the context of it. Having a poor season might not qualify for the Champions League. To get a last-minute win against your bitter rivals, they celebrated it like they'd won the competition itself. And you can see why the fans would cling to that. They created a a hostile atmosphere and the players fed off that like you could see how much it meant to them all not just at the final whistle but every time they scored every time they got an equaliser like they needed to win that game it was so important for them considering the year they're having the period they're having when you've got manager under pressure and their style it probably suits playing Liverpool when Liverpool aren't yeah. 100% at the races like if you sit deep absorb the pressure and absorb it well and hit Liverpool on the counter-attack you can cause them problems when Liverpool are at their best, that doesn't matter. They've got Virgil van Dijk at centre-back or they've got Alisson at goal and you're not getting past them even if they're the only two men left. But when they're not quite there and it's a, a misplaced pass from a, a Nunes or Elliot makes the wrong decision in a corner and you've only got Bradley back, some things can go against you and that's what's happened there. It's just a, a run where Liverpool gone again and again and again. They've got so many results along the way and this one, it didn't fall their way and United just had to be mm. at their level. Like Even if they go to the FA Cup final, this performance is still going to be what they remembered the season for, like the 7-0 was for Liverpool last year. Mm-hmm. I also think as well, it's, it, you know, the, the results have normalised to the fact that you've got so many inexperienced players on the on the pitch. You know, you're Connor Bradley, Bobby Clark yeah. coming on. Yeah. Still got Kelleher in gold. Okay, he's very, proven himself to be a very good goalkeeper but he's, he's the backup goalkeeper. And he's inexperienced in terms <clears> of Game experience, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, he's, yeah, yeah. he's 24, yeah. isn't he? But so he's not a kid, but it, you know, he's not played hundreds of games. Jarrell Kwan's are playing 120 minutes at Old yeah. Trafford. Um, these are some of the things that you've, you've almost that have been masked a little bit by the, the results of the last few months, and, and they have played a huge part in that, of course. And we, we can't say that Liverpool have got by in spite of them because they've been a big part of it all, but occasionally they do. Um, you are reminded that there's so much inexperience 
in the, the overall setup at the moment. I'll yeah. throw Ahmad in there as well, because when he comes on, he, he looks like he's 16, 17. He looks a very skinny boy. You think he's so young. But all those players you've just mentioned, I think they played more for Liverpool than he is for United. He's older than all of them. He's like a £40 million signing for United from Atalanta, I think it was, a few yeah. years ago. It's not the same thing, is it? Liverpool have just turned to the academy again and again and again, and these players have stepped up. It's just it was a strange game, which a strange ending, but one you could all see coming. Yeah, and a couple of people in the in the comments here, and, and thanks if you are listening on YouTube. Please give us a give us a like. Um, but but yeah, um, a couple of people saying why the clock goes so strong against Sparta, and it was a training game. Yeah, I mean, it was that... over by fifteen minutes, and it was over before it kicked off. Yeah, like that... I can't be having that as as a as as a um, you know a, a thing to be clock with, a stick to be clock with, because it was a it was a training ground game. You know, I think it's one of those situations where. If if the game doesn't go to extra time and Liverpool don't lose at the end, if they win on penalties, even you won't ask that because because I think the yeah. idea, the plan going into that Sparta game was get some minutes in some of the players' legs who haven't played. You know, Salah was a perfect example of someone yeah. who barely played over the past two months. So was Lai. So was Lai's the same. Get and some minutes into their legs and get some more experience and get get them ready for United. And yeah. like you say, almost like a training session. And yeah, I think in an ideal world, he would have taken Salah off, but couldn't because of um, cause of other injuries and other... Bobby Clark, you know, wasn't Bobby it? Car, Bobby mm-hmm. Clark precautions, stuff like that. But but I, it's one of them, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think it's really easy to sit here and, and nitpick. We'll talk in a minute about Klopp substitutions or about Cody Gakpo, but, but ultimately it's been a very, very good season. You know, and I, I've seen a lot of people saying this is why it's hard to win quadruples. Even the best teams don't win that many trophies. When Liverpool won the league at a canter in 2020, the only thing they won. Yeah, and they, and they went out the Champions League, and you looked at it and thought, God, such a waste, you know, against Atletico Madrid. They went out the FA Cup at Chelsea. Chelsea, yeah. They were, and goal for both, wasn't it? Yeah, and and I, and I just think who knocked them out the League Cup that year? Do you even um, remember? Pass. Was pass. that the early one against Chelsea? or Was that the year before? Oh, it was Villa. It was Villa. Villa. Club yeah, of Club. course. The Club so didn't count. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's got rolled off, didn't they? So yeah, I just think it's easy to to pick holes in parts of games, but over the course of a, a long season, with the amount of injuries Liverpool had, the amount of games they've had to play, and different t- scenarios they've had, yeah, you, not every substitution is going to be right. Not every team selection is going to be perfect. Not every performance or pass is going to be picked perfectly. So. It feels a bit futile to this do that. That's why I'd bang the drum again and say, scrap extra time. We don't need it in modern football anymore. Like, yeah, <laughs> Liverpool won a trophy off it. Well, would you just go straight to penalties? Go straight, straight to, to pen. penalties. Just have pens. <laughs> exactly. off. Just have 90 minutes of pens. There's so the many matches in football now, and it's going to be even more next year with the Champions League expanding the Europa League, <clears> the Conference League. Liverpool's seen, what, three players pick up injuries and extra time there? It's, yeah. You don't need this extra 30 minutes. Granted, we've had a really entertaining extra time period yesterday, but normally it's boring and it's teams just knackered they can't move very far they just sit back and wait for penalties just get rid of the extra half hour go straight to penalties and we can all go home early and Liverpool found themselves in a position yesterday where you're looking at it and you're thinking oh what, you know what you could bring Jaden Dans on here and with respect to Dans he had a fabulous month but he's played three senior games yeah, yeah. probably about 120 minutes of senior football if that uh, and that's where Liverpool are at the moment because of the players who they've got missing and it's not it's not kind of excuse making. It's just just the reality of the situation. You know, Liverpool have done really well to ignore that for so long and make that, you know, a, a, a smaller issue than it could have been. But yesterday was maybe a step too far. Which is which is sorry. Which is why the yeah. international break has come at a great time. Really, you know, as much yeah. as you'd like to <clears throat> flush it out the system and get back to to winning ways on Wednesday or whatever. Now's a good chance to rest up and um, get a few bodies back. Do you think, in a weird way, this game could provide? Plenty of positives in the sense that if you clop, you get the, those players in don't here and say, look, yeah, have a bit of a break. Hopefully they don't play too much international footy. They should all get phantom injuries and pull out in my in my book. But but you get them in and say, look, you know, we were in control of that game. We had big chances. We missed chances. We were a bit silly at times in possession. We didn't choose the best pass. We, you know, the, we, we, let, we let them off the hook. We go there again and... Four weeks, three, three weeks, three, yeah, seventh is it? You know, we'll have more players back. We'll be a bit more refreshed going into that game. Well, that's what Let's Trent take our frustrations back. out. Jota on should be back. Yeah. Jones will be back. Canate will be back. Yeah. Raven Birch will have played. Yeah. T- tell you what, I'd love if Klopp got them all in the dressing room at Old Trafford and said, "Are you playing in an in international game?" And I think is it only Simakas who's 
play yep. in a competitive game? Simicast has got playoffs and those got World Cup qualifiers. Yeah. You got a few of the twenty ones are in qualifiers, but the rest it's all friendly. So say just say to them two, go on, on, on you go. And though you're the captain anyway, so we can't really get you out of it. But <laughs> Liverpool have already got a bit of special dispensation from Egypt that needs to keep Salah on 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 measures after the next two weeks. So say, look, bigger picture, huge ends of the season. The Israeli needs to be playing in this friendly and whatever it is. Like, that's know. what his BBC interview was. Oh, Lucho's could, done his groin. Could quite well have been. I think we need to mention that, don't we? You said after the game that Diaz has injured himself. Um, so Diaz has done his Nunes groin. Nunes has done his hamstring. hamstring back back post ankle. twisted his ankle. Mm. Um, I mean, they won't be fabricated, but let's hope they're, they're exaggerated a little bit and yeah. um, we just see them drop out of international commitments over the next fortnight and, and just keep as many as possible on the major side and rest them up and get them in the treatment table and get as many back for what's going to be a huge couple of months. It's funny, actually, I, I won't name names, but um, there's, there's an Everton supporter in our office who sort of insinuating that Liverpool have had a lot of luck and get a lot of luck, but it's funny. I mean, the, the luck will... Luck with, with games or Well, injuries? just in general. And, and I think you probably, if if you're not a supporter of Liverpool, you will, you will watch their games and think, ah, oh, they always find a way. And and there's an element of luck about that. But it's very lucky think... when we had a goal wrongly yeah. uh, disallowed but, against but, Tottenham. But, 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 I, but I actually think there's so many elements of the season where if only Liverpool had a bit of luck, you know, like yeah. if only... You you look at yeah yeah that Tottenham game the Arsenal penalty Trent hitting the bar even you know was was quite unlucky in that game the um, the the Man City game penalty at the end even in this one Fernandez you know Fernandez should be sent off I mean, how many times do you see someone throw a full blooded tackle in like he he puts in completely missed the ball take his man out on a yellow card and the referee bottled that one didn't he really let's face it he he, he probably didn't want to. Show the the second yellow. The, the you know seasons can be defined on fine margins, but there's a lot of the fine margins. I think this season have gone against Liverpool. Do you think that's fair to say? I think it evens out across the course of a season. Every team in this league and all competitions will say this moment went against us. This moment went against us, and then you'll have a few fortuitous moments as well. It just. There's so much inconsistency with the officials this year. It seems the levels have gone worse mm -hmm. where you can see that instance. If we go for Bruno Fernandes one, we've seen games where there have been players sent off for lesser offensive uh, offences somewhere. They've just completely turned a blind eye. There's just no consistency there. and It's hard not to be pulling your hair out going, if only this had happened, if only this yeah. had happened. But because the level is bad, I think it affects everyone. There was one at Bournemouth, wasn't there? You know, I know Liverpool go on to win that game. But I remember it was almost the exact same tackle as as, as Curtis Jones, and they, there was nothing. You know, they looked very. Oh yeah. yeah, was it Billing? Was it? Yeah, and, and so many so many times. I think this season Liverpool have had to overcome, and whether that be injuries, fixture lists. I think of all the red cards uh, at the start of the season. Red card, as well. yeah, the red cards. The, the players season. and Klopp always mention those. Like that, yeah. they must have really been annoyed by what happened in the early weeks there, because yeah. any chance they get, they do mention it. You know, like even yesterday, and again, fine margin, Salah's off by what. An arm, yeah. You know, I, I thought he was on side at the yeah, time because I yeah. thought Lynn lost what was in in their area. So, so there's there's so many fine margins, and and I think Liverpool, you know, I think we should be positive because they've overcome so much. And and again, I, I hope and I'm sure the message is Klopp pulling those players in and saying, look, guys, you know, yeah, it, today's gone against us and it's going to hurt, and it's not nice to see them celebrating. But we come here again in three weeks. Yeah. Look yeah, how yeah. good, look at the levels you've shown this season. Go and do it again. Play anywhere near the levels you can. United will be family. overconfident in three weeks as well. They'll think they've got Liverpool's number now. I think I think there'll be an element of that, yeah. And I think and I think Liverpool have had two goals at them now and they need to show that they're, they're the best team. To play devil's advocate though, I don't think yesterday was in any way of uh, down to the referee's decision. No, no. So many not, games when I'm we're just left talk, I'm talking about it. I, moment. I think I've said loads of times that <clears throat> nothing does my head in more than moaning about refs and, and I think yesterday is one where there was nothing really to, to moan too much about the refs. Um but uh, on the flip side, I guess you'd only remember the ones that went against you. Um, you know, we were talking then about Liverpool having to overcome. Maybe maybe they got a bit lucky with the Allison one against City in, in November with, with the goal that was disallowed. But generally, I think Liverpool have been on the the wrong end more than more than the uh, beneficial end for big major calls like that. 
Certainly this season. Certainly this mm. season. I think I think they've had to overcome, and yeah, they might have had a bit of luck. You know, Crystal Palace away, scoring late on um, when they didn't really play very well, things like that. You know, and that was strange as well. With it was a lengthy, the play carried on, didn't it? When Palace got the penalty, yeah, and then yeah. they called it back. They yeah, they couldn't call it back against yeah. Tottenham because yeah. the play had restarted. It's just yeah. why didn't they call back Rashford yesterday, or at least look at it? He seemed so like he was offside for their first goal. Yeah, and like what's clear and obvious, what isn't. Yeah, so so that. But there you go. The, the, they're just the elements of the season, and I and I think, I think we have to just remember how much Liverpool have overcome this season. And I, you know, I've seen a few shouts, a few shouts in the comments of complacency, and I've, I wouldn't, wouldn't know whether I call it complacency. Perhaps they were a little bit comfortable within the game, and perhaps they were in two minds, which is 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 normal, isn't it? Psychologically, if you like, well, do we overcommit with two one up here? Do we overcommit and try and score, or do we, you know, they've done that at the end of the corner. They thought so chance naive to win the with game. The naive, yeah. Except yeah. you going to penalties, you don't need to try and get that last minute winner. I'm not sure I'd, I'd ever level complacency at this team because I just don't think, I don't think they've shown that over the course of the season. Maybe you could say that in 20 minutes of a game here, but but by and large. They don't seem like a complacent side, do they? Let's talk a little bit of Cody Gakpo, who um, is coming in for a bit of stick, I think, online. And personally, I think it's slightly unfair, but but it's fair to say maybe this season hasn't been his absolute best, of course. Yeah, uh, I mean, the problem he's got is he's probably fifth of, of the five choices at the moment up front. Obviously, Diogo Joss is out, so he's getting a little bit more of a nod. He's, you know, he's a good squad player, isn't he? And I think more more than ever, football is a squad game. I think um, probably best... I mean, if you'd asked him, he'd probably say he's best operating off the left of the front three. Obviously, Klopp prefers him down the middle or, or maybe even occasionally as a bit of a, an attacking midfielder in, in the adventurous 4-3-3, but he's the furthest forward. Um, Still still waiting for, for, for him to show... Prolonged form, aren't we? But back does that come back to a lack of rhythm and momentum? Because he's never in the side for long enough. Yeah, he's asking to come in twenty minute spells here or there. Apart from the Europa League, thirteen goals this season. He's more than played his part. Um, but yeah, I mean, look in your in your pecking order of forwards, someone has to probably sit at the bottom, and yeah. and it's Cody Gakpo for Liverpool. It's not a major indictment of him. I think he's a decent squad player and will have a part to play. But at the moment, he just seems to be a little bit short uh, when he's he's being called on, if, if that's not being a bit harsh. Uh, that's the key for me, Theo, I think. Ultimately, you've got a squad of players there and some people have got to sit at the bottom of certain packing orders. And, you know, Gakpo isn't isn't as good as Darwin Nunes or Mohamed Salah or, or even Luis Diaz or, or um, Diogo Jota. But he scored 13 goals. He's contributed... A lot more than than you know the equivalent in other squads, you know I'm sure that there'd be a lot of teams again. United would be one of them. You'd think they'd, they'd love a Cody Gakpo. Try to get him. You know exactly. And and I think I look at last season. I think maybe the problem with, for Gakpo this year is he, he had a promising end to last year, and a lot of us thought well he'd probably build on that, and he, he hasn't quite done that. If anything, he's sort of gone the other way a little bit. But I certainly wouldn't be thinking about anything drastic because I think. You know, you're not too worried if he starts up up front, Brighton in the next game. No, you're not. If all the forwards are fully fit, non form, any of them can start alongside Mohamed Salah. It's not mm-hmm. like two years ago where you're playing a Champions League final, everyone's available. You're never starting a Rigi or Minamino, whereas you could start Gap. Yeah, he could be your first choice option there. And people forget he started the season first choice and he was doing pretty well like yeah he had to drop into midfield whilst they got the players in um in the end zone uh, all the other sort of back and forth we had with graven birch but he was start of the season first choice up front and it's only when nunez then has that amazing game against newcastle where they go hello darwin nunez has arrived yeah and gakpo's yeah. still clinging to the, the space against like, tottenham he scores yeah. injures himself in the process yeah, yeah. and he's been playing catch up since then and Nunes is having the season of his life so you're not going to drop him at all Klopp loves Luis Diaz like he's such an explosive option on the left hand side he's not offering as many goals as a Sadio Mane did in the role but he's still so dangerous he's so important to how they carry the ball forward yeah, yeah. and Gakpo he doesn't have that clear position in the team anymore whereas he did last year like the eyebrows raised when it was Nunes going to the left rather than Gakpo but he had a run of games as the centre forward he was getting goals he was getting assists he was dropping deep at the right moments he was linking up really well whereas now you look at it and he just doesn't have that set position you don't know where he's going to come on I think I remember the City game at the Etihad he gets brought on 
but he's putting in midfield. And then they take off one of the forwards and he thinks he's going up front. So, oh no, Salah, you go up front. Elliot's right wing. You're staying midfield. Is he a left winger? Is he a striker? He goes on the right wing as well. Whereas Diaz knows he plays, he's left wing. Salah knows he's right wing. Nunes knows in this form, he's up front. And Jota, just nothing phases him. He scores wherever you put him. He's just there to be a nuisance and get about. Gakpo doesn't do that. He's lacking confidence. You can see that when he's on the ball and he's missing so many chances. Whereas Nunes misses a chance, you know two minutes later he's going to have another chance and then he's going to have another one and the goal's going to come. It certainly doesn't affect Nunes, does it? It like doesn't it affect him the same players. way. Again, though, on, to, on the flip side, to, just to continue playing devil's advocate a bit, if, uh, if you were to say that Liverpool were getting the money back for him in the summer and we're going to spend all of it on a replacement, would you stick or twist? Well, that's the, I think the, the second part of that is the key, isn't it? Does, are they going to spend all of it? And, I, and mm. I'm not necessarily convinced A, they would do that and yeah. B, they would find... Look, look you know, the, at the end of the day, to me, Gakpo is just, you know, Minamino, but two years on, and, and Minamino was a Rigi a couple of years on. I, I think Gakpo is a better player than either of those two yeah. players, and and I think his ceiling is higher. But he will be better next year you know, with form, confidence under a new manager. It's a fresh start. But I, but I, I don't necessarily think that that is definitely true. I think I think he might he might get worse. But but I, what I'm trying to say, <laughs> what I'm trying to, but what I'm trying to say is like Origi and Minamino played their part in big moments. They they yeah. scored big yeah, goals yeah. in big moments. You you have to have a squad. You have to have people that play their part. You have to have people that aren't quite as good as others. And that that's just how football is, isn't it? And I, you know, seeing, seeing some people say, "I just sell him," you know, he, he needs to go. And I was thinking, well, they they would have sold Origi after a year, and he wouldn't have played his part. You you just let these people play their well, part. Remember when Liverpool yeah. won the, the League Cup and the FA Cup a couple of years ago? Klopp went massive on. Minamino and Origi's yeah. efforts going, we're not here without them. Their goals have got us here. But he's never felt the need to do that for Gakpo, where it's exactly the same story. Gakpo scored so many in the cup competitions. It feels like um, the treble season when you have Murphy stepping up or Smeet. Yeah, exactly. He is in that sort of bit-between role where he's not starting every week, but he's still getting goals and assists. He's just not got the rhythm because of yeah. it, because he is in and out of the team. Yeah. The, the money the pillars were for him as well, if they were to sell him. Only in England, a club in England, they're paying that. And yeah. where, where's he going to go? That, to, to answer your question, that, I wouldn't be desperate to sell him, but I wouldn't be desperate to to keep him either. Yeah. You know, if, if they got a decent bid and he moved on, then then fine. You just hope that they replace and you know. But I don't think he's. You're looking at him. He's not threatening the front three or four, but also. I'm quite happy if he starts the next game. I, I'm not. I wouldn't be worried or frustrated. And I actually think it's funny people go, "Oh, why didn't they bring Dan's on?" Well, I'm pretty sure if he brought Dan's on and the results the same, you'd be going, "Why did you bring an 18 year old kid on and not Cody Gakpo?" You can't have it every way, can you? And and unfortunately, Gakpo, the big moments aren't going for him. But you'll have a couple of big moments before the end of the season. He'll score some important goals with the forwards. Is you look at them as a collective, and it is one of the strongest collectives Liverpool have had as a five. It's stronger than mm-hmm. what they had a couple of years ago. Um, it's whether they have this again next year or if there have to be changes. Yeah. If Saudi come calling again for Salah or if there is something in the speculation linking Diaz with a move away when he's that little bit older, it's like, well, do you cash in on him if the, the offer's right? Obviously, you've got Nunes there and Jota's great at what he does. Gakpo needs to maybe follow Jota's example a bit more of you're not going to start every week, but just take your chances when they come. Going back to Jota, though, People forget Jota's not always been perfect. No. It was the, he had, he had a, a slow start to the yeah, season too. Yeah, and 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 then suddenly he's, he's, he's just sprung into life in the around November, December. And he come back and, on and Boxing Day, yeah. Yeah, and he's been brilliant. But Jota's not always been in this good form, and and it might take him a little while to get back. So yeah, I think I think Gakpo has played his part. He's done well. My biggest frustration with Gakpo is I I felt like towards the end of last season they were almost grooming grooming him to be like a Firmino Mark too. Mm. You know he was dropping in deep. He was he was linking up play. He was a goal threat. He seemed quite intelligent at, at getting Liverpool on the ball in deeper areas. And. Um, He's drifted away from that se- this season, and I think you. But you could never do that with Nunes in the form that Nunes is in. No, you'd no, never could. play a Firmino S player there when no, you've got no. Nunes scoring 15, 20 goals and getting the same in assists. I think you made a good point before when you, outside the pod, when you said he, he reminds you a little bit of Havertz in the sense that he doesn't really have a full, proper position. And and I think that will always play yeah, on people's minds. Yeah. But Havertz is contributing to a good Arsenal season, and, and I think Gakpo. He's contributing to, to a good Liverpool season. I, I just don't think maybe... So he's going to get worse, but he could score the goal that wins in the league. <coughs> that, that's what we've learned here. Well, he, he might not... That's the thing. There's, there's no absolutes. He might not get worse. He might not get better. He might just remain... This might be his level, which is in some ways is fine for Liverpool right now because he contributes and, and that's okay, isn't it? I don't, don't necessarily 
think you can apply Mohamed Salah standards to every single player in your squad. You, that's why you, you know, that, otherwise Gakpo wouldn't be there, would he? Yeah. Because he'd want to move on and go and play somewhere. But so. not his best day yesterday. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. And um, not probably Klopp's best subs no. all round. Tough to come into a game like that, isn't it? If you're not, you're not feeling the game, as, as Klopp might say. You, you know, you're thrown on with 15 minutes yeah. to go and it's blood and thunder and it's United to Liverpool and whatever. Sometimes it takes a, a bit of time to get into it and, yeah, the the pass for Elliot was poor, wasn't it? He, he could have yeah. chose much better yeah. in that one. And on another day, we were talking talking about the Liverpool winning. They are the the margins that they always talk about. Yeah, so, I mean, he's low on confidence. He's low on form. Like if he's got the confidence, if he's got the form, that pass isn't as bad. He puts more power in it. He picks the right th- decision. Yeah. He shouldn't be though. He, he scored the other night, didn't he? And played played but quite well. He missed well. a few as well, didn't he? Like he's in the last few weeks, he's missed a lot of one on one chances, and you can see him looking to the heavens, going, "How has he missed that?" It's just not 100% right at the moment. But Liverpool wouldn't be where they are. They wouldn't have won the League Cup. They wouldn't be this far into Europa League without players like Gakpo. Yeah. You know, and I think they wouldn't be challenging the league without players like Gakpo. He's played his part. And, and yeah, yesterday wasn't his finest moment. But, but like, I think if, you, if you're suddenly making your mind up on that and saying, right, that's it, get him sold, he's not good enough, then... I think I think you're being slightly immature, yeah. really. What's I think telling though is like we're having this massive debate on Gakpo's involvement. Nunes is the one who messes up for the third well, yeah, goal. Yeah, but, but you, you forgive Nunes, don't you? It's quite quite easily because people talk, cheer on everything he does. You know, but, it sounds like he was yeah. injured as well, but it's, like, yeah. by what Klopp yeah. was saying, doesn't it? Yeah. And then so was Gakpo. We don't know when that happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. true. Talking of not the best moments, Klopp after the game <clears throat> gone viral. Really, um, Klopp's reaction to a, to a Danish um, reporter. You've written a piece about it, Gorsi. I just wanted to talk about it because I, I do think it's it's funny how people take that and go, see, you know, like he's an awful guy, but you know, isn't what we like about Klopp is that he is quite human, and yeah, he sometimes he's great and he's fun and he, he's a good laugh, but other times he's angry and he's frustrated, and that, that, that's kind of what makes him who he is. Isn't it? Sounds like he's human, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was an interview with I think it was with Viaplay, wasn't it? That yeah. Danish publication. Um, Mr. Fredrickson or Fredrickson, the, the reporter. Um, yeah, they asked him a couple of questions about fitness and fatigue and, and other too many games. And, and Klopp is clearly at the end of his tether and, and walks off and says, um, you're clearly not in your best shape, which was a reference to his his kind of competence, I guess, his professionalism as a journalist. There wasn't any anything fitness-related or anything like that. I've seen some people, some people accuse him of. Yeah, and he just storms off. But um, I think in the wider context, that's probably one of about ten post-match interviews that he has to do before the the press conference itself. And after such a damaging, dramatic defeat at the home of the most fierce rivals, knocked him out the FA Cup. I think Klopp is basically just at the end of his rope, wasn't he? And and it can happen. Um, Klopp doesn't give you tappings in terms of questions that you're asking. He doesn't always laugh at you and respond in kind, and he's not always your mate. Um, and I think it's just one of those things. Uh, you know, the pale clutching that's gone on has seemed to be coming from fan bases outside of Liverpool's. I think Klopp is secure enough in his own standing within the game and, and Liverpool's fan base that he's not too bothered about what people think of him. I think he knows how he's viewed generally. Um, but it's just one of those things. You know, Ferguson did it every other week when, when every United lost. Elson Wenger, Pep Guardiola, Mourinho. Benitez, you know, they've all done it over the years. It's just that's what drives these elite sportsmen, isn't it? And sometimes the journalists are a little bit of an easy target. Uh, or if they ask something that they don't necessarily agree with, then it, it happens. You know, it's happened to me, I'm sure it's happened to you. Um, and, you know, elite manager isn't happy after lo- after not winning is not really a big story, is it? It's, it's just a bit silly, isn't it? I, I always find, especially, it, it's always driven is it by you know fans and, and let's face it we're all as football fans you're all hypocrites and we'd all be you know Pep Guardiola had done the same we'd all be like oh look at Pep not happy because he hasn't won but you know I, I always think with Klopp he suffers because there's this like image of him as this sort of beer drinking yeah. hipster yeah. like laugh out loud give everyone a hug Dortmund manager who who sort of like everyone loved and wanted to to be wants to have him as their manager and and in reality He's not. There are those moments, but he's not quite like that. He's a, he's a bit more. Yeah, he can be can be a bit of a grump, but that's what I like to respect about him. He wears his heart in his sleeve, and he he's, he's very real, isn't he? And and the be I'm sure that Danish reporter and 
if you've if you've read, he's he's come out today and spoken about it, and says there's no ill will between them. But I'm sure if that Danish reporter interviews him again after the next game, Klopp, I don't think Klopp would go out of his way to say, "Oh, sorry about that," but I think he would just treat him professionally, and it would just crack on. He wouldn't he, he wouldn't ban him or anything, and certainly other managers have done that. Yeah, that's yeah. what the uh, the commentator, the reporters said. He said, "No ill feeling. I don't expect to hear from Liverpool. I won't be contacting them." But it's just business as normal next time. Like Klopp's allowed to react how he feels. Like it was obvious that Liverpool weren't at the best because of the injuries, and they were feeling tired after extra time. Mm -hmm. And Klopp's just been a bit irritated that the reporters stated the obvious and trying to provoke him into giving that sort of reaction. And this gives him the reaction he wants. He's gone viral. He's doing this interview that's spreading all over uh, the media at the moment. They got a lot of attention on it, but they all snap. Like we remember interviews where you've got Louis Van Gaal going mental about United fans being on his back, or Mourinho storming out, going, "I've won more Premier League titles than everyone else." Yeah. Uh, Guardia going oh, I'm happy more than you believe when he's got that face of thunder yeah. you remember when your rival managers have those moments because it's a bit amusing isn't it yeah the people do jump it's on a it tap it, isn't it for, yeah. for rival support but then Klopp is as you said he's got this more friendly image as well he, he's great for a soundbite the same way Mourinho was when he first came to England before he became very grumpy us against the world whereas Klopp still treads that line Emo but, Mourinho was um, um, David Squires yeah, yeah, the emo, uh, the emo <laughs> yeah. I, what, what, I mean, what I would say is it's probably over the mark, probably a bit extreme, but you know, it's not not the worst crime in the world, was it? I, I remember um, at Wolves last season when they, he took on James Pearce. I thought yeah. that was that was well over the mark, and yeah. and you know, not just because he's a colleague and a friend, but I just thought that was totally unnecessary and a sign of things that were getting to him at the time. Um, I remember asking him a question over Zoom about Genie Wijnaldum. And before he'd even finished his answer, someone had messaged me saying, oh, I think he's been a bit harsh on you there. I can't remember what the question was now, but um, sometimes he just gets a bit worked up and that's why Liverpool fans love him, because he's human. He's not, like we say, he's not this caricature of, yeah. you know, big smiles and bear hugs every single time. You know, he's he has a broad range of emotions and it just got the better of him on, on that particular exchange. It, that it doesn't help that his exchange, it, it's... It's not open to interpretation, but it can be interpreted in different ways. Like we've seen it as it's you're questioning his professionalism, the the reporter, the way he's asked that question, and that's how he's interpreted it. But if you read it just black and white on the paper, you can see it as an attack personally and what, that, you're yeah. not on his great appearance. Yeah. yeah. So because it's got that mixed meaning to it, it makes it look a bit worse than it is. And it's not Klopp's first language. There are gonna be those little stumbles over what he means and what he intends to say. It's just made it seem a bit more unsavoury, yeah. whereas really what he was saying is, I don't like that question. You can do better than that. It was, it was yeah. interesting the other week when we had the chance to speak to him before the Carabao Cup final. So Pep Linders had done the pre-match press conference because he'd been doing them all the way through the, the Carabao Cup and, and he was up for the final. Um, so then when a few, myself and a few of the national national colleagues got to speak to Klopp upstairs, sort of out the way from the usual <clears throat> hustle and bustle of the press area, Um Instead of just us all crowding around and with our dictaphones in hand and standing up, we were sitting down a little bit like this, and um, it was twenty minutes, and it was it was fascinating. You know, some of the things he was saying, he was clearly refreshed and re-energized, and he was in a great mood. And you could tell the fact that he hadn't just done twenty twenty five minutes in front of the the cameras. He was in a lot more of a um, you know a buoyant mood, and and the stuff that he was saying as a result was uh, was really interesting and. He was in great spirits, and and listening to him on that day, you could see why Liverpool fans absolutely adore him, and and why they, you know, go to the gates of hell with him because it was that kind of rousing, inspirational type of stuff, um, which is what you get when he's got the energy and he's got the um, the willingness to do it. But when you're ten interviews in post match about getting beat by United, sometimes you're at the end of your, your tether and. I think that's all it was, and I think it's a bit of a storm in a teacup. And how many digs have we heard him have at the media over the last few months going, he, he hates having to do all these interviews. Like, I remember yeah. even after the League Cup final, he like apologised <coughs> for taking so long because you knew, do know you could have just watched all the other ones. We don't have to do it again. Like, yeah. That joke, he doesn't like the fact that there is mm. such an extensive uh, responsibility there, and he has to just say the same stuff again and again and again and again. Of course it's going to frustrate you. No one you frustrates him, but as well, after every game, every time they win, someone goes, are you going to stay now? Yeah, <laughs> every time they lose, yeah. they go, is that why you're leaving? Like, you got that yesterday, didn't Yeah, you? yeah, so I just thought, God, you know, like, he's not, you know, like, can we stop asking him about whether he's going to stay or leave? You know, we 
he's made his decision. Well, he said, didn't he, yes. on that day, um, we'll talk about it, ask, answer as many questions as you want now, but after today, please don't ask any more about it. And yeah. I think that was a fair request. Yeah. Probably unrealistic, but um, I don't think there was anything too wrong in what, what he asked on the day, but uh, I suppose he's yeah. always going to get those yeah. questions. Every and... single former player and pundit coming out and going, first thing Michael Edwards needs to do is sit down with him and convince him to stay. FSG needs to hold me. Didn't you write that? I don't think I wrote it as in that's what they need to do. Oh. <laughs> I don't think he, they need to try and persuade him to stay. It's like it's the right time for him to go if he feels he's tired and he's. It is the right time for him. You can understand why he wants to go. There isn't any way to convince him otherwise. So I don't know why everyone thinks that it's just a case of you can have that conversation with him and he's not going to have thought it through and you just give him a few bits more money or you give him an extra month on his holiday and then he's refreshed around to go. No, he's been here a long time. He's a granddad now. Let him live his life. He's not going to walk out of defeat tonight. United now and go, that's why I'm going. You know, It's, yeah. it's 4-3 <laughs> FA Cup. Enough of it. Defeat. That's why I've had an awful, or yeah, beat Sparta Prague at home and goes, you know what, guys, I don't, I don't know what I'll miss here. You know, I've got to stay. You know, so one more thing to talk about, which is quite serious, but I, but I think it's worth addressing. Fortunately, um, I mean, it, it happens more often than 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 with um, you know, than, than is necessary really, or it's never necessary, I should say. But yeah. tragedy chanting yesterday at Old Trafford, uh, the effort. FA have released a statement. There's been one arrest. Um, Greater Manchester Police have confirmed, and uh, another Premier League have just released a statement before we've come in here. Of uh, course, I thought Doyle wrote a really good piece um, on it this morning, and he pointed to the recent Liverpool City game. And um, you know, it's one game, but but I feel like with Liverpool City, the two clubs have worked very hard. Yeah. To try yeah. and to try and resolve some issues between the sets of supporters and try and stop these unsavory incidents happening and you know that you can never stamp it out completely but but i feel like it's come down and the, the point doily was trying to make is that you have to show that you want to change and you have to take responsibility to, to make those things happen and you know isn't it time wouldn't it be great to see man united come out strong and and, and say it was loud and clear for you to hear on commentary to hit for you to hear on on sky for you to hear in the ground for you to see i mean you you only have to look, unfortunately, on social media to see the usual senseless idiots um, caught on video. Uh, like, how do how do Manchester United get through? You know, we're almost almost full twenty four hours before you know the game kicked off yesterday, and we've still you know as things stand, I don't know whether it's come out in this podcast. As far as I know, not heard anything from Manchester United about what was loud and clear for everyone to see. Yeah, it's really poor, isn't it? You know. Man City didn't co cover themselves in glory when, when similar incidents happened a couple of years ago. But <clears throat> before the Carabao Cup game uh, last season, just after the World Cup, the two clubs and the, the respective fan groups, I think it was possibly Blue Union. I don't know if it's not yeah. Blue Union, is it? They're, they're Everton, aren't they? Yeah. Um, can't remember the name of the, the, the City group, but Spirit of Shankly were one of them. They sat down together and looked to try and work together and, and eradicate what had become a horrible rivalry, really. And... I think we're starting to to see the 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 fruits of that work. That I think the two games this season largely largely passed without incident. But yesterday was was awful, wasn't it? For for all of that and some of the videos you see on social media have, have been terrible. And, and I hope the fan who's been arrested, which Greater Manchester Police have confirmed, uh, I hope he <clears throat> faces up to um, to what he's done. And you know he's, he's going to lose his job over it, I'd imagine, and whatever else. And is it really worth it going to a football match and chatting about? Whatever it is, um, whether it's Hills related, Hazel related, you know, anything else. Um, it's just, it's idiotic and it's, um, you know, it's, it's just not worth it, is it? Um, from a personal perspective for, for people singing it, you gain nothing from it. Uh, but I would like to see United come out and be a bit firm on it and you know there have been, well, there has been a arrest. Um, this one fella wasn't alone, was he? Um, chanting it, so um, you'd hope that more action is taken. From um, from the clubs and and the football association that are liaising with Greater Manchester Police, aren't they? And sometimes you know you these organisations are quick to release statements and they they pay lip service to it, and you don't really see anything else come from it. But I think the last maybe year or so, you're starting to see arrests made as as a result of these yeah, types of yeah. things. And 
that's progress, even if it's only you know incremental. Yeah, Stuart Tudor in the comments, the chanting was worse yesterday than it has been for a long time. Mm. It was so audible on TV, embarrassing and makes it terrible to watch. And yeah, I must admit, I, I, mean, I agree it with every word. The game either. Like, there Sorry. was loads before when yeah. they were just warming up. You yeah, can, they, yeah, they went through the whole works. I, I don't need to repeat what the chants yeah. were. We all know them by now, but. Every single one you can think of, the United fans gave a rendition of at yeah. some point. I, I was doing the Facebook Live of the warm-up, and you can just hear the guys next to you laughing yeah. and saying some of it. Yeah. It's like, why is this your first thought here? Yeah. And like, on the counter side, I thought the Liverpool fans were superb. Like They were singing long after when they are being kept mm. in behind. I didn't hear anything negative from them. They didn't respond to it anyway, apart from the tongue-in-cheek jibes at Manchester that you expect, that both sets of fans do. Yeah. That is... Like Curry, those ones are, but you don't need to bring in poverty chanting. You don't need to bring in tragedy chanting. It's not a nice side to the, the rivalry. Maybe it was so over the top, partly because of the season United are having, because they haven't got anything else to look forward to and they want to have those extra jibes there. But it's just, there needs to be something better done about this now. Yeah, I mean, th there's a million things that they can take the mickey out of Liverpool for, which is which is all absolutely fine. You know, they, they, they can say certain things, but this... I think, for me, it's got to come from within. I think one of the most impressive things I thought Liverpool did in recent years was um, after an FA Cup game, actually, was it at Stamford Bridge? Um, they called out, the club called yeah. out their own fans over yeah. um, homophobic chanting. And, did they do it against and, Norwich as well when uh, Gilmore yeah, was there online? Yeah, Norwich. That, that's what it was, yeah. That was, it was like Norwich, that. sorry, yeah. yeah. It was, it was and, on loan from Chelsea. And, and, and the club took a strong stance and, and, it, and it was a brave stance because so many clubs don't want to take on their own fans and they, and, and fans, you know, unfortunately, will often find excuses for, oh, it's not homophobic, or it's not, we're not trans in a, or tra tragedies. There's different connotations, but they know, they know what, they know the connotations, they know the context around what they're chanting, and I thought that was really good from Liverpool, um, and it was the first major step Liverpool took to dealing with that, and now we don't hear those chants. You'll, you'll always hear the odd idiot. But we don't hear those chants anywhere near as much. I no, think it's fair I, I to can't say. really recall it. Yeah. So yeah. just sort of refer to what you're talking to. It was when Klopp sat down with Paul Amand, wasn't it? Of, oh yeah. yeah of Klopp course, House, yeah, yeah. Who, obviously Liverpool's preeminent LGBTQ plus group, and uh, Paul's also on the LFC yeah. supporters board as well. He sat down with the Egan Klopp, and it was just a bit of a <clears throat> a kind of ed educational thing about why that particular Chelsea chant is is wrong and why it should be kind of silenced and. Um, fair play to the club on that one and, and Liverpool also work with Luton after the away game at Kenilworth Road over mm -hmm. poverty chatting and, yeah. and that type of stuff and I don't recall many incidents of that in the, the game at Anfield so these sorts of things appear to be working um, be nice if, if more of it was done I'm sure it does go on behind the scenes that we're not always yeah. kept in the loop with but um, yeah I mean it, it just Going to a footy match against your, your local rivals or your arch rivals or whatever, and then you get involved in all that nonsense, you end up getting arrested. You're going to lose your job. It's just totally unnecessary. And um, yeah, uh, the worst thing I think for, for the United for me, and, and it, I've always felt like this, and it goes for both sets of clubs because you know there, there have been incidents in the past both ways, but I think both clubs they know all too well how how these tragedies. Like almost define the football clubs, don't they? You know, the Munich tragedy and the Hills tragedy are, are just a huge part of the fan culture of each club. They know how it's affected so many people within within the both clubs. They should know better. You know, they 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 should be able to support each other. And and it, it's so sad that we're here in twenty twenty four, and it's still. Well, the support was there, wasn't it, after Munich yeah. when Liverpool yeah. were one of the yeah. first ones there, and then vice versa, and vice versa. Yeah. with the United. Like, it's and just... true football fans and true supporters yeah. of the clubs, I think, are often some of the best people to support each other. But, but so, social media doesn't help, yeah. does it? Yeah. Especially with the younger generations who who it doesn't, you know, it's, it's just stories to yeah, them. Sure. Isn't it? They went around in 1985 or 1989 or uh, the Munich air disaster, and was that in the 60s? Uh, the late 50s, yeah. late 50s. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, none of us are around them, but you, you know what I mean. It's uh, social media just just yeah inc increases the nonsense, doesn't it? And um, yeah, I think the Liverpool it helps that they've got Jurgen Klopp, but he's in such a powerful position. If he speaks, the fans listen. Mm. Yeah. If he's got such a social responsibility here, and he knows what position he's in, if he says something that's not right or something needs to be done, the fans are educated on that, and then there's more being done around that. United could bring Alex Ferguson out tomorrow yeah. and or today, and and he could say. 
you know, I've experienced so many of these games, it's time this stops. And and what would be more powerful than that? So um, before before we finish up, some breaking news. Uh, Nottingham Forest have been deducted four points um, for um, being found guilty of um, breaking financial fair play rules. Um, I, I don't want to talk about it too much long because it, it doesn't affect doesn't affect Liverpool, but but um, a strange old season, and and I think it could define the summer the way just, the way some of this is going. Coming a, a thing now, isn't it? Yeah. You know, clubs deduct the points. Um, seems seems to be too easily handed out. But uh, again, these profits and sustainability rules have been in place for over a decade now, haven't they? And uh, they're not necessarily a new thing. It's more just that um, clubs have been sailing to the wind for for too long. But uh, <clears throat> you know, I suppose thankfully it's it's none of Liverpool's. Ultimately, none of their business, but yeah, it's strange, is it? I mean, you'll see it at the end of the season two asterisks alongside yeah. Everton and Forests. Could be a third. Have someone get another one themselves. <clears throat> yeah. Is so, there, um, what's that done to the table? Has it changed anything? Have you got it there? Because um, obviously, the, the big girl for Everton, I guess. The, the big question now is what happens with City, but obviously, we're not going to find that out for no. another year at least, you'd imagine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just s strange, isn't it? Um, Save if, us not going to date, but it would drop. Forest down into the relegation zone, they would go on to 21 points. Luton would come out of it on 22. Didn't they but, just draw it as well? So, the weekend, uh, only, yeah. like, only just kind of keeping a half an eye on what Forest have been doing in the last 18 months. You, you, it's no surprise, is it? They've, they've been through 40, 50 players. They've had about six goalkeepers in that time. Just <laughs> crazy what's, what's going on there with, with their owner, Maranakis. But I, but I think if you look at if you look at Everton, you look at Nottingham Forest, and and you know, look, let's look at Chelsea. You know, I, I'd be astonished as Chelsea aren't at some point punished, um, well, or or at least charged with certain offences because it just seems to be. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't have any. I don't have any evidence of that, so I don't want to make claims. But at the same time, you know, you look at what they're doing and think it seems, it seems bonkers, doesn't it? Well, and they're making just... huge losses, and then and then the the, the charges set against Man City's name, you know that. However you feel about Man City, that is a huge elephant in the room that they that they won't that they won't be able to get rid of until those charges are dealt with either way and and even if they're but then when those charges yeah. are done the next question is okay that's up to twenty eighteen what about, yeah, since, what about then? That, since then so I think again it underlines that yeah we we might not love when Liverpool need a defender or a midfielder and FSG don't yeah. go out and, yeah. and and flash the cash but at the same time like. Liverpool are in such good health that you you look at what's going on around the league. Too many clubs, like you said, have, have sailed close to the wind, and you know, thank God Liverpool haven't done that and aren't prepared to do that. And there's even a suggestion that Chelsea don't want to finish in Europe because the UEFA's financial rules are a, are a bit more stringent than the Premier Leagues, and that mm -hmm. might impact them adversely with the money they've spent under what two years is it? Um, Imagine being in a position, by the way, where they're Probably best one of the best players this season has been Conor Gallagher, and they might have to sell him in the, the summer. The desperate to flog I mean, him. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, and the manager plays him as 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 giving them the captain's arm. But yeah. imagine if Liverpool got to a point where they're like, God, you know, we could bring, bring in some of these youngsters through and they're great, but we're gonna have to sell one of them. It, yeah. It's just to, it's no way to for sell a club Alexander to be Arnold because, yeah. and I hate the fact that football supporters know about the phrase pure profit. Yeah, like that's just yeah. thrown around like it's nothing. Like that shouldn't be happening. Yeah, and 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 they they they'll say, oh, that the rules. Aren't fit for purpose. They shouldn't, and and, and I think you know clubs should be incentivised to keep their academy products. But the the reason they'll have to sell Gallagher is because they've spent so mm. badly in previous years. It's no one's fault but their own, you know. And, and the rules are there, and they are maybe they aren't perfect, but everyone signed up to them. Everyone knows them, so it's it's a cycle now as well, isn't it? Like, this is the second year Everton have been caught out. Is it going to happen again next year, or do they actually get it all in order? Yeah. Like Forest as well, they can't suddenly just clean it up, clean it up overnight. I'm all for a, a more uh, sober yeah, yeah the Premier League in general, though, instead of this crazy spendthrift madness that's gone on for too long now, hasn't it, really? Um, yeah. Clubs are losing all kinds of money. I want to see transfers like, like the next person, but, you know, Chelsea's... Chelsea, for me, like the... Like, this example, every time I hear Pochettino in a press conference saying we need a striker, yeah. and I think, hang on, you've just spent 80 million on two strikers. You know, 60 million. I, if they're not fit, then unfortunately that's part part of it. You can't just go and buy another one. It doesn't work like that. Well, you Armando Broy has gone on loan to Fulham yeah. because they couldn't conclude a full transfer at the end yeah. of the January. But they know that they can <coughs> try and flog him if he does well for 
for yeah. X amount of pure profits. It's it's a crazy situation. Yeah. It's funny then that he's barely played because the striker that Fulham already had is the one who's backing yeah. all the goals. So I just think buy and sell well and you won't be in that position. Um, and unfortunately, too many clubs don't. So anyway, um, we'll leave it there. Um, Thanks everyone for listening. If you're on YouTube, give us a like. Can only see one thumbs up. Just the one. I want to see. I want to see some more. There's been 50, 60 people sitting here watching. Mm. Give us a little thumbs up. It, it helps massively. Um, how can we follow you, Ghosty, on social media? Uh, like at PT you. Ghost. Uh, you're not a personal and... trainer. No, no, right. certainly not. But uh, I do go on some meds apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you can you can show people how to look good. You're just to kind of train them. <laughs> and Theo Squires, how will we find you? At Theo Squires Echo across yeah. the board. Easy peasy. And I'm at Joe Rimmer 88. Um, yeah, and um, give us a like, subscribe if you're watching, or oh, sorry, listening on, on Apple Podcasts. Um, give us a star rating. It is massively, massively helpful. And we appreciate your support. We'll be back on Friday. Um, it's the international break, so we're going to try and do something a little bit different. We'll either do a Q&A or... Sustry, there's yeah, even been um, Yeah, there's even been talk of maybe doing a little quiz. So if that? if that's something that you'd like to do, tell us in the comments. I'd Who be, says um, the questions? I will. Well, he he can't live on the pod. He can't Google them, can he? And then, oh, yeah, yeah. and then, and then make out like he knows. So, um, we'll put him to the test. But yeah, if you fancy a quiz, let us know. If not, we can do a Q and A, um, special. If not, we could we could do something a little bit different. You know, we've, we've been thinking about doing top tens or go across the season or just I don't know moments. But whatever, whatever it might be. Give us um Cody Gakpo's top ten Liverpool moments. Yeah, give us some um give us some of your thoughts in the comments where. We'd be glad to hear them or give us a tweet. Um, And thanks very much for your support. We'll see you again on Friday. Ta-ra.